Thank you everyone for coming today, um, especially for my second ball in Daniel King's birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, What a scientific answer. I have to say, uh, Logan has been um, such a student also. He was great and he did something amazing. I don't want to say it's too much, but I want to say uh, one thing about it. He knows how and what to do. When I have, or my friend, or my peers have some notional ideas about, hmm, maybe something like that. Oh, maybe a car or a robot will be cool. And then, at a week, that day, at a week, he thinks, he does something, and then he goes back to me with a transformer. That's what he does. He always thinks about it and knows what and how in order to and I think this is an amazing talent uh, that Logan has. And, and uh, his work is a collection of those amazing things. One of his papers recently has been uh, highlighted as a OSA spotlight, meaning even the academia appreciates his novelty and his contribution to this community. So with that, um, today Logan will prove he's ready to graduate. And we will all see and make sure that's the case. It's all yours now, Lord. Thank you. Um, my computer might pick up your audio if you speak. So if you're not okay with that, uh, you will have to leave, unfortunately. <laughs> if you're a committee member, I will mute the audio. Absolutely. Um, so thank you for coming. I'm going to be talking about freeform testing using deflectometry today. Before I get started, I want to highlight what this picture is. Uh, this is Cassiopeia A. It was produced using three telescopes. It was uh, made using images from the Gendre, the Spitzer, and the Hubble, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. The crazy thing about this is how far away it is, and also how long ago in time we were able to produce a stunning image using telescopes. These were the last generation of telescopes. So many of these telescopes are kind of more standard in shape. They don't use as much what we call free forms, but they can still do such incredible science. The next generation of telescopes is going to make use of free form surfaces, as well as crazy giant mirrors. Uh, and the things that we're going to be able to see will be even more stunning and enlightening to us. So with that said, that's the talk. That's it, I hope you guys liked it. <laughs> um, hmm. There we go. Uh, with that said, I'm going to be talking about the motivation for why we want to do freeform testing with deflectometry. I will then uh, investigate something called model-free deflectometry, infinite deflectometry. This is alluding to Dewook's statement yesterday that it's like the Marvel movies and Infinity War. Uh, and then I'll talk about temporally modulated infrared source for infrared deflectometry. It rolls off the tongue. And finally, concluding remarks. Additionally, during this talk, despite my best efforts, uh, I've been advised by professors to not use acronyms. I still use them. So if I use something, please look up here. And I've written it down. Uh, and I've tried to give a brief explanation for what it means. If you have questions, please stop me as well. So first up is the motivation. Why would we want to test freeforms? Well, before we get to that, what is a freeform? On the left, we can see uh, someone in the audience, Dr. Dewoop Kim, using what I assume is an uh, augmented reality system. Augmented reality, virtual reality, I'm sure you've heard about, are optical systems that allow us to either augment what we're seeing with something that doesn't actually exist, or in virtual reality, we're simply sent into some virtual world. So 
it's often easy to think about, okay, well, virtual reality is toys or video games, but they have very important uses. On the right, we see a doctor performing some surgery with an augmented reality overlay. So it goes beyond just toys. It starts to enter the realm of medicine and uh, therapy, education. Um, it has a lot of really important applications to our lives. Of course, that's not all that Freeform is. Uh, we have something quite as fancy as a teapot or a car hood. We also have illumination systems, which very often are highly freeform. On the right, we see a lens which is trying to achieve very high uniformity of color illumination. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that this is my area of expertise, particularly because it's Dr. Koshal's area of expertise, and I don't want to look like a fool up here. Um, but suffice to say that illumination is truly everywhere, uh, and it's highly important in our daily lives. So freeform is everywhere. Those are kind of useful, but somewhat abstract to think about. So when I say freeform, what I mean is it's typically non-rotationally symmetric, and it's a non-standard surface shape. What I'm showing here is rotationally symmetric and a standard surface shape. It's just a sphere. But what if I walked off the edge a little bit and took a segment of that sphere? In fact, what if it's not a sphere and instead it's a parabola? So I've walked off to the side of a parabola, which is shown in gray, and I've now selected some off-axis segment. This is what's referred to as an off-axis parabola. It'll be shown up here as well if you forget. This is a very common freeform surface. We use it a lot in telescopes particularly because as you can see, we can have light come in and reflect off and either come to focus off to the side or maybe we have a secondary mirror or cameras or spectrometer or all sorts of other devices that we can put over here and then guide the light to. Why is this important in telescopes? That first picture I showed is of something that's millions of light years away. We're getting barely any light when we look at it. So we have to capture every photon. It's really important that we don't have obstructions. So this design is very useful. One example of it would be the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope primary mirror. Uh, that's a mouthful. I'm going to refer to it as DKIS from here on out. And it's also written up here. So this was my first exposure at the College of Optics to not only freeform surfaces, but to totally crazy giant optics. Um, I was fortunate enough to get to work on the fabrication and metrology of this mirror, primarily the metrology really, but those are intertwined as I'll explain. It's a 4.2 meter diameter uh, off-axis parabola. It's made from something called zero dur, and Suffice to say that that just means that when it heats up or cools down, it doesn't change shape very much. It was extremely expensive because of that zero dirt. Uh, and it was polished to 20 angstrom surface roughness, root mean square. That's RMS, which again, I'll refer to. And without getting into the details of that, it's analogous kind of to the standard deviation. Overall, how is that uh, up and down across that surface? 20 angstrom is atomic level. It's stunningly smooth. Um, it's really unbelievable. The more that you investigate it, it's hard, truly hard to imagine this was made. But it was. We fabricated it in this basement. The telescope will be used as the premier solar telescope. It'll expand our knowledge of the sun and solar phenomenon. We'll study solar flares, sunspots. And you can see here it's a little bit hard, but it's an off-axis parabola and the light will come in from the top and get deviated out of that beam path so that all these other telescope parts, other secondary, uh, tertiary, up to eight mirrors are not in the beam path. So we're getting all that light. Uh, that seems a little bit deceptive because we have plenty of light from the sun, but it's important to collect all of that. So what did this look like at the start? It was a giant chunk of glass. It's extremely rough. It was 50 micron RMS surface air. That's a little bit abstract, but just imagine looking at something that's not reflective. If you've ever seen ground glass, it's around that roughness. It's something that doesn't reflect light, quote, specularly. That is, in the visible region, if I shine light on it, it would just spread out. It wouldn't bounce off back to my eye. We took that mirror down to 20 nanometers RMS surface air. Uh, that means that from the ideal off-axis parabola shape, 
we took a chunk of glass, we ground on it, we polished on it, and we got it down to 20, 20 nanometers RMS surface air. Uh, I'll explain what that means in a second, but it's shockingly accurate. When I say that we ground on it, this is actually from GMP, which is made across the street. We take a polishing tool and we just rub on the mirror in certain locations until we get to the right shape. The question is, how do I know where to grind or polish? How much should I polish? How hard should I polish? How fast should I polish? And the answer is metrology. Uh, we use typically commercial interferometry. It's the gold standard. No matter what, if you're trying to make a perfect mirror, typically you're gonna use a commercial interferometer. You're gonna look at that mirror with this device and that will allow you to say, yep, it's good. Or it's not good, we need to change things. Commercial interferometers have some key characteristics that make them ideal. They have high spatial resolution. You can imagine if you compared your cell phone camera today to one of the old point and shoots, maybe from the early 2000s, you can see that there's more pixels on your cell phone camera. This is really useful for us because we can now pick out smaller areas of the mirror and say, okay, yeah, we can see this part's good, this part's good, this part's not good. I'll show you an example way later on of a, a system that doesn't have a high resolution camera. They typically have lower dynamic range. What I mean by that is that an interferometer is a null test system. This simply means that we have to have a null optic or something that's the shape that we want to compare to in order to test something. And there's a limited range of how far away what you're testing can be from that null optic for it to be testable. I'll show examples later on of what that looks like and what impact that has. Um, extremely high precision. I mean, interferometers these days, uh, at the very least, they claim to get angstrom level precision. So they're really impressive devices. And that of course comes with a high price tag. Uh, but you get what you pay for, I hope. Uh, also, I apologize for using Zygo. I meant to use an Apray picture here, but <laughs> it is what it is. On the other hand, the title of my dissertation is Deflectometry. Um, deflectometry has a, quote, high dynamic range. I talked about an interferometer has to be nulled, and that means there's only a limit to how far off you can be from that ideal shape to be testable. I'll go into it a little bit later more, but broadly, it's sufficient to say that deflectometry can test a wide range of surface slopes. It doesn't matter if it's really flat, really curved, or really flat, or maybe wobbly in between. We usually can test it if we have the right setup. Uh, it has high precision, particularly at high, higher spatial frequencies. So if we're trying to see, OK, maybe not the power, maybe not how curved is it fundamentally, but are there little scratches? Are there little ripples? We can test that really well with the system. The reason we can't test lower frequency shapes like power or astigmatism, which is simply kind of how much does it look like a Pringle, uh, is because these systems are highly sensitive to um, calibration error and configuration error. I'll explain that uh, in a pretty dense series of slides to follow. Uh, and finally, it has low cost. So, these aren't the only test systems that we have. There are obviously a huge range of other systems, but these are the ones that we'll primarily be looking at today. <clears throat> With that being said, the real question is what is deflectometry? And it's not easy to explain. Daywook and Isaac have used examples such as Scooby-Doo, which is very intuitive and easy to understand, but I thought that we had to go a little bit deeper than that. So, with that being said, <laughs> what is going on in this scene? Deflectometry, actually. You can see a reflected image in Morpheus's glasses. You can see Keanu's eyes are seeing this image, okay? More important, we also see that there's a source in the scene. Keanu is reaching for blue pill or red pill. These are the two sources in this scene. Keanu made the right choice. Excellent. So what is happening? How is this deflectometry? Keanu Reeves, Neo in this movie, his eyes are looking at the mirrors, which are Morpheus's glasses. Morpheus 
has two sources. One source here, one source here. Let's make a cartoon out of this. The first step in deflectometry is to capture data. So step one, we have our mirrors, we have our sources, and we have our detector, which is an eyeball in this case. Light leaves the source one, the red pill. It reflects off of the first mirror, Morpheus's glasses, and is captured by our detector, Keanu's eyeball. Next, we have a second source position. It is obviously at a different location. It leaves, it strikes mirror two, also successfully enters Keanu's eyeball. Okay, we have our information. The next step is to calculate local slopes. What we really wanna know in a deflectometry test is, what are the surface slopes of the mirror that we're testing, or the UUT as I refer to it through the rest of this talk? The first thing is to calculate the distance. We know that it's a distance z away. In a real test, we would measure this very precisely or imprecisely if we don't care very much. We then uh, can use simple geometry. And I mean, truly, this is geometry that you learned possibly in high school or before and potentially forgot uh, because you thought you would never use it. So I have the wonderful chance when I speak to my girlfriend's students to say you actually will use math if you get a PhD in optics. <laughs> We also know that the detector is some distance away from our mirror location, similarly for the source. We can therefore set up a series of right triangles, and this lets us calculate the angle that's made by the light. Using a series of other steps, uh, I don't need to get into too much detail, but I'm happy to if there are questions. We can calculate what's known as the surface, the uh, normal vector, pardon me, of the mirror. This allows us to calculate what is the angle from the normal vector to, for example, something perfectly flat. This can be correlated to the surface slope of the mirror. When I say surface slope, just think of rise over run. That means that over some set distance, the mirror inclines some amount. We have to do this for all mirrors, so we do it additionally for the other mirror. We then have to integrate these local slopes to reconstruct the mirror surface. Integration is something that we get into in calculus. I don't know how many of you have taken calculus, but it's easy to simply diagram it out and say, okay, we start at one point, we know it had a rise over a run, so it goes over, and then we knew that the second point has, in this case, a negative slope, so it drops down. We've integrated it. We've reconstructed our mirror. And then we output this. And we also notice something important. That doesn't look like Morpheus's glasses. So there's a key thing here. One, deflectometry assumes that we have a continuous mirror surface. There can't be huge jumps. There can't just be spaces in the mirror because of how we integrate it and deal with our data. And two, no matter what, there will be errors when we reconstruct it. We didn't get Morpheus out. Instead, we got Jordi LaForge with his visor. This means, again, reconstruction. We accept this. There will always be some minor errors, and any uncertainty leads to large errors. You can imagine, if I thought that Morpheus is holding the blue pill at this location, but actually it's over here, the slope that I will calculate will be totally wrong. So it's very important that we know where everything is in a system. This will come up throughout the talk. That was also the fun part of the talk. The rest of it gets really boring, so I apologize. So in a real system, we want to measure in three dimensions the local slopes. So we want to know the x slopes and the y slopes. And that allows us to reconstruct a full three-dimensional surface. We have to use the geometry. Typically, we'll use Cartesian coordinates. And it gets a little bit more complicated, but fundamentally, the idea is the same. We will expand beyond using a, a red and blue pill, and we typically use something like a digital display and a camera instead of an eyeball. As I said, the mirror will be referred to as a unit under test. And what's happening here is, uh, first of all, ignore the arrows, okay? What I wanna show you is, okay, on our screen, we're showing some sinusoidal pattern. That pattern's hitting our mirror, it's reflecting off, and our camera is seeing this distorted image. But why the arrows? Why are they pointed in the wrong direction? Uh, 
I didn't even realize. I made a joke about it earlier that I shouldn't take Greenham Camp, that, that I shouldn't have light going from right to left. And here I do. Um, what we have is that on our camera, we have our detector pixels and we focus that camera on the mirror surface. So these pixels now represent big pixels on the mirror. They just got blown up and they're sampling parts of the mirror surface. If we consider the surface slope of those sampled areas, the pixels, we can trace them to here. <clears throat> and we can imagine that light, if it continued its path, would reflect and hit some unique spot on our screen. So these little red dots are simply showing, instead of this perfect pixel grid, we're getting some distorted uh, array of pixels. Um, it's not what's happening in reality. Obviously, the light's leaving the screen and going to the camera, but hopefully it's slightly useful to help imagine. So I hope that I've explained deflectometry, but I now need to convince you why it's useful. <clears throat> Here's a plot showing the fabrication cycle of the DKIS mirror. Uh, we can see that uh, we have grinding. Well, this is flashing, that's not good. We have grinding, polishing, and then passive lap polishing. So what that means is that we start with this chunk of, uh, of glass that I showed you earlier, it's very rough. We grind on it with something also really rough and we just cut swaths out of it really quick. We rapidly approach the desired surface shape. We are testing it with something referred to as LT, that's a laser tracker, and additionally IR Scots, that's what I wanna highlight. IR Scots refers to infrared Scott system, Scott system, uh, which is infrared deflectometry. You can see as well that in that infrared Scott system, that that's because in grinding phase, again, we can really quickly go towards the shape we want. And infrared deflectometry allows us to test this really rough surface quickly and accurately. So it makes for a very efficient fabrication cycle. We then switch over to something referred to as SCOTS. It's an acronym, I didn't write it down. It's for Software Configurable Optical Test System. It's simply visible deflectometry. And you can see that's used for a very extended period of time. It brings the surface shape from roughly um, one micron RMS of surface air down to approximately 20 nanometers RMS surface air. So that final ideal surface shape and again, we finish it off with interferometry. It's the gold standard. We're going to use it no matter what. Uh, I do want to highlight, you can see support recalibration and Scott's calibration. Without going into too much details, the Scott's calibration is analogous to what I said about if you don't know where the hand is. We had something in the system that we didn't calibrate right, and we are getting incorrect data. So that led to some delay, but nothing too serious. Uh, the DKIS mirror was fabricated approximately over about a year, a little over a year. This is insane. For those of you that don't often build giant mirrors, uh, this is truly crazy. I mean, it was, it was stunning how quickly and how accurately this mirror was made. So what did we get at the end of this process? How do we guide the fabrication process? At the very end, we see on the, on the left-hand side, the interferometer is showing us that the RMS surface air from ideal is 19.4 nanometers. If we look at a smaller area of this mirror, I said earlier, it's super smooth. We see that the RMS surface air over maybe 100 millimeter square area is about three nanometers. And if we look at maybe a one by one or three by three millimeter area, we see that it's sub nanometer. So it's into that atomic level. Uh, it's crazy how accurate this mirror was, but what does 19.4 nanometers mean? Uh, I had one example which was somewhat abstract, so I will use a different one, which refers to uh, a brewery. And I'm sure that more of you can, can relate to that than to Mount Lemon. Uh, if anyone's been downtown to any of the breweries, 19.4 nanometers would be equivalent to saying from here to downtown, that height air, 19.4 nanometers, is equivalent to half the width of a human hair. That's how accurate this mirror is. You guys are, yeah, perfect, all right. You guys are supposed to say, wow. So, it seems like we have everything figured out. There's no need to do more research. We've obviously made a perfect mirror. We use deflectometry. 
I didn't even need to be here. Um, we identified a few key things during the DKIS process, uh, Daewoo, Matt, Greg, and others uh, working collectively, we said, okay, here are key areas that we can improve upon. And additionally, along the way, we discovered some new things that we thought, wow, we didn't even think of this. Maybe we can do it. And we tried it and figured it out. The first of those is model-free deflectometry. Model-free deflectometry fundamentally relies on the idea of, do you know what the model of your optic is? Before I jump into deflectometry aspect of this, I wanna highlight interferometry's aspect. I mentioned earlier, interferometry is a null test method. So when we talk about free forms, instead of being maybe a sphere, we have something totally crazy shaped. And I'll show you that in a second. How do we get a null crazy shape? It's hard, right? It's already hard to make some crazy shape that we're trying to make. So to make a perfect one seems impossible. Instead, what we do is use something called a computer generated hologram. It's over here as well, if you forget. This is simply, simply a hologram that we generate that makes the perfect null of what we're trying to test. So we have to know what we're trying to test. In deflectometry, we also require some knowledge of what we're trying to test. I mentioned earlier that light from that pill will go to the mirror and then go to the eye. But one example I gave is, okay, well, maybe I don't know where the hand is, where the source is. Another example is maybe I don't know where the mirror is. Maybe I assume the mirror is tilted like this and I say, okay, well, it hit here, that's one of my points. But maybe it actually was just flat and I'm off a little bit. What happens if we have some incorrect assumption is that we end up getting the wrong surface reconstruction. Instead, we'd like to do something maybe that would iterate our reconstruction. You can see on the left, we can look at the system. Maybe our reconstruction model is a little bit more, assume that it's a flat. Uh, and really, the true surface is that it's a curved sphere. This isn't all that crazy. I mentioned during the grinding phase, we're taking huge amounts of the surface away very rapidly. Uh, it's hard to know what that shape is. Uh, we have some methods to calculate it, but there are still some uncertainties. Another very common example, I don't know about you guys, but for myself, you might find an optic lying around and not have the prescription. How do you test it if you don't have the prescription? What we would like to do is say, okay, well, our first guess is way wrong. We can see it, it's way wrong, and we assume that it's a short. So then we reconstruct the surface, and we get some new surface out. Let's use that as an updated model shown here. So now the ray is hitting over here and bouncing up into the new surface. The reconstruct is going and again and again and again until we end up at our final reconstructed surface. This is important because it allows us to converge upon an accurate surface model and improve that surface reconstruction accuracy. This just highlights it. It's kind of spelled out very clearly. That first guess, the slope that we have is way wrong. The correct slope is shown in the blue dotted line. You can see there's a huge difference. There's one other really key thing to see here. And I'll explain it in a minute why it's Why don't we just draw the new line here? Well, not only does the ray intersect at a different angle, but also at a different location. So it's very important for us to accurately know where that ray is hitting our surface model. How do we do that? We created what's known as model free iterative deflectometry or MID. Um, we start with input data about our optic, which includes the size of our optic that we tested, as well as the piston of the optic. That simply means that one point on the mirror surface, we have to know where is it located distance wise from the rest of our components. And that's it. We don't have to give some model guess. We don't have to say, well, I think it's a flat or I think it's spherical. That's all that we put in. We take our recorded data from a test and we take that flat surface. We segment it using Delaunay triangulation. That simply means that we take this surface model and we break it up into what it's known as well-behaved triangles. These triangles make surface planes. So you can just imagine a bunch of little planes across our surface model. We take our camera location and the pixels from our camera and we treat them as rays. So we say, okay, I know what the camera is. I've calibrated it. So I know that this pixel is gonna leave the camera exactly like this. 
And therefore, using what's known as a molar trumber line plane intercept, we can take that ray, transmit it to our model, and say very precisely not only which surface plane it hit, but where on that surface plane it hit. Um, this is something that's often used with video games. So you can imagine in like some shooter video game, you want to point at something and shoot and know where it hit. Once we have those intercept locations on our model, we can take the camera, the screen, and the intercept locations. We calculate the slope with geometry again. We take the local slopes and we integrate it. In this case, we use something known as a south wall integration, which is a modal integration. Um, and if you have more questions about that, I'll be happy to answer them. And finally, we integrate it and get some new surface model. So maybe instead of flat, we say, okay, great. It's now shaped more like a sphere. There are a few things to keep in mind here. When we do deflectometry, we don't know tip, tilt, or piston. Uh, therefore, particularly for the piston, I I said earlier, we measured that. So we get some new surface and we say, all right, well, I know one point on the surface is precisely here. So shift the whole thing. This helps to allow us to not enter into a null space. So I gave the example earlier, okay, you have an optic, you don't know what the surface shape is. Let's say you have the optic on the left. It looks pretty simple. It's a bare glass surface. Uh, you look at it and you say, okay, well, it's concave. No problem. I'm gonna guess the best fit concave sphere. You throw it on the interferometer, you use a null sphere as your null optic, just a sphere that should fit it, and you get this, which looks totally crazy. This is obviously not an ideal null for those of us that are in optics, and I'll give an example in a second of what an ideal null looks like. Something funny is going on here. This is a very funny shape. So this surface was generated using what's known as a magnetorheological finishing technique, or MRF. And it simply allows us to kind of polish in very unique shapes to the surface. Why is this null not good? I mentioned earlier that we use CGHs to come up with custom nulls. What we want when we get a null situation in an interferometer is to either just have maybe tilt fringes, just a few straight line fringes, or maybe we get to a null, which would just be no fringe. It's just white. It's just one null fringe. Without a custom CGH, custom null optic, we can see that for free forms, you can get very dense, odd fringes. And this is an issue because interferometers have a limit to how accurate they can reconstruct a surface when the fringe density is too high. So high fringe density is bad, lower fringe density is good. That has a lot of high fringe density because we didn't have a custom spiral CGH. So we measure it on the interferometer. We want to say, OK, we came up with this mid method. How do we know if it's good? We measured the same optic with a deflectometry system. We reconstructed the surface using the model free iterative deflectometry for six iterations. We additionally, as a comparison, reconstructed it using a traditional method of just saying, it's just flat. I don't know what it is, so I'm going to assume it's flat. That's not that great of a guess. We can figure out how spherical it is. So we said, okay, instead of assuming it's flat, I'm gonna assume it's a sphere, the best fit sphere as our model. So for the model-free iterative deflectometry, I wanna highlight first what that iteration looks like as the surface evolves in its reconstruction process. In the first step, we can see that the surface height change, just a constant map, if anyone is a hiker, you'll be familiar with it, but broadly it's showing how that height is changing. We can see primarily as it's becoming concave and spherical. We see that the surface height change is in millimeters per year, that's about 10 of a that's millimeters of change. It went from a flat to sinking down millimeters. That's a huge difference. Um, and it's heavily adjusting primarily low frequency shapes, such as power, such as astigmatism, that Pringle shape, Etc. <clears throat> As we step to the next iteration, we see, okay, it's only 10 to the fifth, but this is still a huge amount of change between one step to the next. And maybe we're starting to get into mid-spatial frequency shapes like astigmatism or coma or things like that. At the final iteration, iteration five to six, we're down to 10 to the zero. So just a handful of nanometers of change. It's sufficient for us to say, okay, it's not really changing very much anymore. We can stop the iterative process at this point, we've probably converged to the ideal surface. 
How do we evaluate the ideal surface? You may be wondering or not. Uh, we use what's called Zernike terms. This is a very common technique in optics, particularly in the world of optical fabrication and testing. Zernike terms are very convenient for us because they apply well to circular optics. <clears throat> we fit the first one through 11 terms. Those are shown here and highlighted what that surface shape looks like. To the interfer er interferometric map, the mid reconstruction, the traditional flat base reconstruction and the traditional spherical base reconstruction. And then we start removing these Zernike terms one by one to look at, okay, what's remaining? How accurate is it improving these low order shapes? So here's what we end up with. First of all, I wanna highlight the interferometric measurement is on the left-hand column. As we move down uh, the rows, on the top row, we removed Zernike terms one through four. That's piston, where is it, tip, and tilt. And finally, um, defocus, or basically how curved is it as a sphere. In the middle row, we've removed Zernike terms one through six. So we've now removed astigmatism. How Pringle shaped is it? And then finally, on the bottom row, we've removed one through 11, which is including now terms like coma and trefoil. Um, and if anyone has questions at the end, I can go back to that slide showing the Zernike terms. First thing that jumps out, the interferometer doesn't look different between the rows. It doesn't have much change at all. This is suggesting to us that in fact, the optic doesn't have many low spatial frequency shapes on it, not considering obviously piston through power. Primarily it has this spiral shape. Okay, this is our gold standard. This is what we're comparing it to. Before I go on, I do wanna highlight you might notice that the interferometer has some missing data regions. These are really important because when we have those high fringe density areas, you can't reconstruct the data. So you simply have unknown areas and we can't say what that surface shape is. If we look at the mid method with six iterations, we see in the top row, okay, already it looks different from the interferometer. It looks curved in one direction. This is astigmatism. So, all right, we have astigmatism, that's an issue, but it's pretty common in deflectometry and it's a factor of calibration uh, and possibly some other things. However, as we start to move down the rows, we see a pretty good matching between what the interferometer reconstructed and what we get from the mid method, meaning that it's compensating coma better, for example, than maybe the other techniques. If we look at the traditional methods, then we see that the astigmatism is higher, first of all, regardless of whether or not we used a flat or a spherical model. The coma, the middle row, and possibly trefoil, of course, the remaining terms, also appear to be higher. And then finally at the bottom, they do look pretty similar. The flat model definitely has some dis dissimilarities um, and that could be due to a variety of reasons. Okay, so we've looked at a lot of maps. Um, frankly, most of us probably don't look at these service maps very often. This is something that maybe a handful of us are very familiar with. So how do we put this in practical terms? I can't help myself, I'm already excited. We measured something with interferometry. We said, this is what it is, we have Morpheus. We measure it and we reconstruct it with the mid method. We get Morpheus again, he looks a little bit different. Okay, fair enough. There are some errors, we accept that. We reconstruct it with the traditional model-based deflectometry and we get Lawrence Fishburne, but it's not Morpheus. It looks a little bit different. Basically what this is saying is that the model-free iterative method allows us to take raw deflectometry data, and if we don't know the surface model, we can better reconstruct it as compared to what we used to be able to do. So in conclusion, model-free iterative deflectometry reduces reconstruction error when no model is available, and it primarily seems to heavily adjust these low spatial frequency terms. Okay. So is this something uh, you leverage some other existing ray trace software or? That's it, yeah. So that's how a, did you do that uh, ray reconstruction? That's a great point. So, so all of this research would not have been possible without uh, Dr. Greg Smith here. Um, he and I worked heavily together uh, to 
create a processing package which allows us to ray trace and iteratively ray trace and leverage that Delaunay and molar trumber uh, calculation. So that's how we did it as opposed to relying on ZMAX, for example, or some ray trace software. So for the next section, we'll talk about infinite deflectometry. Yep. yep. Oh, that's it. So that is a fantastic question. Um, I did research with another group, but broadly what we did is we used something called a deformable mirror. This is simply a mirror that we can push and pull on and change the shape of. And we measure it with deflectometry to say, okay, I know what the shape is. And then we put it in an interferometer and use it as an updating null surface. So if we don't know what the null shape should be, we can adjust this mirror and say, okay, I know the shape from deflectometry and I can use that shape to null out the interferometer. So they can be used in conjunction really powerfully. Yeah, that's a great, great point. I'm glad you brought that up. I didn't include it in here. So, um, so the next section, infinite deflectometry. Um, we've measured convex mirrors so far. And one question is, how do we measure uh, con, or pardon me, we've measured concave mirrors so far. How do we measure convex mirrors? So on the left-hand side, we see the 3.42 meter diameter LSST secondary mirror. This is the largest ever convex secondary mirror created. It will be featured in the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. It was a really impressive optic. However, it, will, it won't pale in comparison, but it's smaller than the 4.2 meter secondary mirror that will be featured in the ELT telescope, or the fittingly named European Extremely Large Telescope. Uh, because there wasn't too much creativity in that name. Um, 4.2 meters is the exact same size as the astonishing 4.2 meter DKIST primary concave mirror we made. So this is stunning how big it is. And a question pops up, how do we test it? You've only talked about testing concave mirrors. So convex mirrors require extremely complex testing setups. You can imagine the light, instead of hitting it and coming to a focus, is going to spread out comes to a virtual focus, but in the real world, that means that the light spreads out and it's hard to test it. In the ELT case, this means that you have a very complicated, custom, expensive test setup. Okay, we're not always testing these optics. What about something more simple? How about just a small convex mirror? Uh, on the left, you can see a infrared lens. It's used typically for CO2 laser systems, but I'm sure that you guys have seen uh, convex mirrors elsewhere. Maybe some of you wear glasses. Not maybe, I can see several of you wearing glasses. Uh, those are convex in surface shape. So how do we test them? Well, for typical convex optics, we might use what's known as stitching interferometry. We use the interferometer against the gold standard. And instead of measuring the whole thing at once, we measure small little spots on it, as you can see here. And we stitch those all together to get the total surface shape. You can also see counter-rotating CGHs in this picture. That means that even for something relatively simple shape, we have to have some custom null optic, and it might be a custom null optic that has to update across the sub-aperture region of the optic we're testing. <clears throat> this gets even worse, though, for testing something truly highly freeform, because we might need new custom optics depending on where we are testing on that surface. I didn't mention this earlier. Um, but CGHs come with a high price tag sometimes. They can cost upwards of tens of thousands of dollars. So it's not trivial to simply buy one and say, that's the wrong thing, let's just get another one. So maybe we can use deflectometry to test this. In our standard deflectometry configuration, which is shown on the left, we can see we have a screen. And I said earlier, what if we trace the rays from the camera and see where the light goes? Well, we can see most of it doesn't hit the screen meaning that we can't test most of that optical surface. This doesn't hit as hard as it used to a few months ago, unfortunately, but I used to say, imagine if we had something crazy like a box screen that could go around your optic and Samsung went and ruined that and made a foldable screen that you could put around the optic. Fortunately, that seems to be breaking pretty often. So it still isn't viable. Um, therefore, what's our option? Well, 
we can use a typical screen and we simply tilt it over our optic. We're only measuring a portion of the optical We're only measuring some small area. What if we put our optic on a rotation stage and we then spin the optic? We're now measuring a new spot on it, a new sub aperture area. This is a little bit tricky to imagine. So what if instead of picturing spinning the optic, we picture that the world spins around the optic? Okay, we have our first screen. And then we have the virtual screen that's spun around. And doing this through a full rotation, we create a virtual TP, TP shape around the optic, and that creates a two pi steradian measurement volume. This simply means that we put a TP of virtual screens around the optic, and we can now test it, uh, even if it's highly convex or freeform. What do we do with all these sub aperture areas? This is getting a little bit into the virtual photometry system. We calculate the local slopes for some small area we tested. We stitch those in slope domain into one big slope map for the whole optic. And then we integrate that as usual and get our reconstructed full aperture surface. What does it look like in practice? We used an iPad Pro as our screen tilted over it. We place our UUT on a rotation stage, as you can see on the left, and we have a camera looking down. You'll notice that there's something referred to as a CMM, that's a coordinate measuring machine. This simply lets us say really precisely, where's the iPad, where's the optic, where's the camera? Um, we tested an optic. It's an F 1.26 convex sphere. What that F slash 1.26 refers to is the F number, and it's simply a ratio of how curved is it relative to how uh, what the diameter is. In this case, F 1.26 is telling us it's really steeply curved. It's a fast optic. When we put it on the infrared deflectometry system, we can see only a portion of the optic. We also measured it, again, with gold standard, the commercial interferometer. And because of some limitation of null optics, we could only measure a 45.29 millimeter diameter aperture. We couldn't measure the whole thing. And this is important to remember because going forward, we can only compare to the area that we can measure. For the infinite deflectometry system, if you're still having a hard time picturing it, what we do is we rotate it, measure a new area, rotate it again, measure a new area, again, measure a new area. And in this way, we can get the whole surface and stitch it together. So we do this process and we compare the infinite deflectometer reconstruction to the interferometer. And we get a bunch of maps. So one thing I wanna highlight before we delve into this is that earlier on in the mid picture, you might've noticed that the different methods were the columns and the Zernike terms were going down in rows. This is now switched for convenience. Uh, infinite deflectometry is shown on the top row, interferometry is shown on the bottom row. We can see on the left-hand column, Zernike terms one through four, so piston uh, and defocus are, are removed from the surface. We're not considering it. In the second row, we have six, so astigmatism as well. In the third row, we're now removing up to 21. So this is now removing uh, a bunch of surface terms, and we're now kind of focusing better on mid-spatial frequencies. And finally, in the last row, we see Zernike terms one through 37 are removed. And this is focusing on high spatial frequencies or odd little surface shapes across the optic. And this is entering the realm of, quote, optical quality testing, really focusing in on, is it truly a precise optic? The first step, we wanna focus on the uh, lower spatial frequency terms. We see pretty good matching between the maps. Um, this surface, uh, was found downstairs and presumably polished without too much care. It was presumably rubbed on in a pretty standard method. And these are somewhat normal shapes to see when that happens. So this is pretty encouraging to us that we see good matching, but we're more interested in mid and high spatial frequencies. At the mid spatial frequencies, we again see good matching between the interferometer on the bottom and the infinity photometry system on the top. However, we do start to see, quote, smoothing effects. So we can start to see that the interferometer is highly sensitive to the uh, 
on the system is showing a very smooth surface. Realistically, it probably isn't that smooth. This is probably an artifact of the infinite deflectometry approach. Most likely it could be due either to the stitching approach that we're using or to the fact that we have a rotation stage. This is a new thing that's introducing uncertainty. Maybe we thought we rotated one degree and it was actually 1.2 degrees. So there's some misalignment and we get smoothing effects. However, most exciting was the high spatial frequency terms. Um, we see very good matching between the interferometer and the infinite deflectometer system, um, meaning that we can now do optical quality testing of convex optics with this technique using deflectometry. Of course, there is smoothing effects that are more apparent um, and that will have to be addressed in future research. So this was good, but the title of the talk was Freeform. So instead we looked at a freeform surface known as an Alvarez lens. An Alvarez lens is a very unique surface. Uh, the first one was fabricated only in 2001, actually. If someone knows otherwise, please correct me. You, okay. okay, I need to change that in my paper then actually. Um, but but it's, a, it's a unique surface where you basically impart uh, low polynomials into the optical surface and it comes in a pair. So in this case, we have a disc of plastic and in that center area, they come in pairs. And when you shift the pair relative to one another, it imparts defocus, or basically light comes to a different focal area. So can anyone think of a good use for this? That's right, they're trash. I don't know why people create them. Um, they're very useful to be able to have very variable focus. You can, you can possibly use them in uh, uh, eyeglass systems or uh, defer to Dr. Trigling, um, but in various aspects, they become highly useful and they're highly compact. So we measured it with the infinite deflectometry and with the interferometer. We don't have a custom null for the interferometer. So this creates an issue because the fringe density So what do I mean when I said it looks funny? Well, when we measure it with the infinite deflectometry system, we see a very odd reflected fringe pattern from our sinusoidal fringe that we show on the screen. Please note that this is not actually from a test. We did center the optic when we tested it. It wasn't wobbling all over. But we measured it with the infinite deflectometry system, and we come up with the measured surface that we reconstruct and compare it to the designed Alvarez lens. So this Alvarez lens was actually fabricated here in the College of Optics by a student using a diamond turning tool. Um, basically, it's a robotic system that lets us carve in very custom shapes. So we wanted this on the right. We got this on the left. Theoretically, it should have peak to valley of 147 micrometers uh, of deviation. That is the highest point to lowest point. The difference should be about 0.15 millimeters. We measured 148 microns and our RMS surface values are very similar. This is pretty astonishing because across six millimeters, we're getting peak to valley of 0.15 millimeters. It's a huge surface change. However, this is the design surface lens. We don't know if that's actually what was built. We can't measure it with the interferometer. Instead, we use what's known as a profilometer and this is simply a device that you set on the optic and drag it across and basically how it goes up and down reports the surface height. So what's shown here on the left is the result from the profilometer shown in a black, black, dotted black line. It's easy for me to say. And the uh, profile from the infinite deflectometry reconstruction shown in a dotted red line. And the difference is shown in blue. It's pretty hard to see. Uh, but suffice to say that they're very similar. So we blew up the difference on this right hand side, and you can see that uh, the difference is jagged up and down. However, overall, the RMS difference um, is only 488 nanometers. So it's, it's quite accurate. Um, so again, maybe you guys aren't familiar with using profilometers or the infinite deflectometry system. You haven't snuck into lab and used it when I wasn't there. So what does this mean? We have a convex optic and a convex optic that's really funny shaped. We measure it 
and we, we design it, and we want to see, using the infinite deflectometry system, did we measure that? We get something that looks pretty close to it, but we have to verify if what we measured is accurate. So we use something to touch the mirror and we verify, yes, this is what we measured. You might notice I'm a big Keanu Reeves fan at this point. Uh, suffice to say that this method now allows us to test not only concave, but up through convex optics, meaning that we cannot do historically with deflect concrete for a full aperture rapid test. Uh, and it allows us to also test highly freeform surfaces such as the Alvarez lens. I'll now move on, uh, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great question. The, you can imagine that this TP only goes up from the table maybe and we have an optic, but what if the optic is truly three-dimensional? Um, if we extended it and mirrored it, maybe put screens below it, then we can now test in a full um, spherical measurement volume and test the entire surface shape. Alternatively, we could always simply flip the optic, but there are issues with that as you introduce new uncertainties and calibration problems. Um, but I think it'd be worth exploring getting two iPads or something and tilting like this. Uh, and the, the, the idea is expandable to measuring something like a spherical measurement volume. All right, with that, unless there are any other questions, I will move on to, to importantly modulated infrared source for infrared deflectometry. So I showed at the beginning that the mirror fabrication process starts with grinding and goes through polishing. However, during that grinding process with the infrared deflectometry system, we see extremely rapid approach to the desired surface shape. So for this optic, this really rough thing that isn't a mirror to our eyes, we can use an infrared deflectometry system. And using an infrared lens, we can have it's just a line. And as we scan it, we see that line reflects beautifully off of a rough source or surface. This allows us to test rough surfaces really accurately. And it allows us to make the fabrication process orders of magnitude more efficient and more rapid. This is highly important for fabricating mirrors. What does this source look like? It's a tungsten ribbon. That is, it's a, it's a ribbon of metal. You stretch it out so you can think of it as a long rectangle. It's placed on a linear and rotation stage, but basically that ribbon is scanned in one direction. We flip it on its side, it's scanned in the other direction. So we can test X and Y slopes. The ribbon is a piece of metal. So the way that we use it as a source is that we drive electricity across it. It heats up and it acts like a quote, pseudo black body source, simply emits light across the whole spectrum. And we can tune it so that we're emitting light primarily in the seven to 14 micron range, infrared light, long wave infrared light. And we have a camera, long wave infrared camera, which picks up that range as well. Before I go on, I do not want to undersell how important this was. Uh, so my lab mate when I first started, Tian Chuan, uh, this was his dissertation work, and it's really impressive. Not only how well this worked, but how much of an impact it had on near fabrication. So the tungsten ribbon is essential. It's still used. It's a highly important source, uh, and it really revolutionized infrared deflectometry testing. <clears throat> However, it does have some drawbacks. It's a piece of metal, meaning that if you heat it up and cool it down, heat it up and cool it down over and over and over, eventually it'll break down. We don't necessarily know if it's heating up uniformly across that rectangle. We also don't know if that ribbon is flexing at all. You can think of a guitar string if you, if you uh, strum it, not only will it have that main vibration, but you might have harmonics above that that are vibrating. Maybe it twists. So there are a lot of issues like that. And additionally, as uh, Dr. Matt Dubin will attest to, without any additional um, considerations, just a tungsten ribbon has low thermal mass. So its thermal emission will fluctuate rapidly during testing, which is not something that you want. Uh, you want to turn on your light and you want to know this is what it is. It's not changing. Again, any uncertainty leads to error in our reconstruction. And finally, 
As with any source, there's a limit to how much power we can pump into it before it simply breaks. This limits what's known as our signal to noise ratio, which is highly important. So considering this, we wanted to create a source that had a highly uniform emission pattern. We want it to be temporally stable. That is, it doesn't fluctuate around during testing. And finally, we wanted to achieve a high signal to noise ratio. And Dewook and I discussed that one ideal way to achieve this without using a CO2 laser, which might uh, cause serious damage in the lab, was to use something that we could modulate in time. That way we can say, okay, anything that's not changing at that frequency must be background noise. It must not be our signal. Now, we can go into it later about how we can actually achieve that. But for our purposes, we designed a source which uses small caps. Uh, you can see these caps here, dots. They look a little bit like LEDs in this picture. So if that's convenient for you to imagine them as, please do so. They're in fact small alloy membranes. And basically you can heat and cool them extremely quickly by driving a current across them. Specifically, they can achieve an 80% contrast ratio at one hertz. Um, based on guidance from Dr. Koshal, we went with an integrating box design. Basically, it's an aluminum box. You shine the light into it using these caps. The light hits a rough surface. So instead of specularly reflecting, instead of hitting the surface and bouncing off in one direction, it hits the surface, spreads out everywhere. Bounce Bounces around, bounces around, bounces around, and eventually, so this exit slit is cut into the top of the box, and the light reaches it and leaves the box. And it doesn't just leave the box in one direction, it leaves the box over a spread of directions, which is very important for deflectometry. We modeled this system in a software package called Light Tools, and we which is important for us. It's one of the goals that we had. And then uh, we fabricated it. And I want to say uh, a shout out to Henry, who truly led the way on fabricating this, ordering the parts, assembling it. Um, it looks a lot nicer than if I would have done it. I mean, it would have been a mess otherwise. Uh, but we got an aluminum box that's rough on the inside. And we put it together and we put these caps in the top. We wire them so that we can turn all of them on at once, all of them off at once. You can note inside them in heat shielding skin. And this simply means that the back of these sources have some heat, particularly as we're turning them on and off, they'll also emit light at the same frequency. So we wanna block that light from a direct view from our mirror to our camera. If we look at it head on, you can see how we have very achieved by turning the source on and taking a picture with a long wave infrared camera. However, it's important that that light spreads out, not that it's just directional. So we did uh, and we determined, yes, it still looks the same. That means <clears throat> it does have a high spread, angular spread in its emission. We want to therefore compare it to something we know. We know the tungsten ribbon. So we turn that on, take a picture of it, and then to better determine what does the profile of that source look like, that is, this big silver line across it, does it look like what we imagine? We imagine that it's a rectangle, should be on, off. One thing to consider here is that this rectangle is being imaged by a circular pupil. When that happens, you get a convolution of the pupil and the rectangle. And suffice to say that we would expect, instead of a pure rectangle, some roll on and some roll off. We don't expect a perfect rectangle. I also want to highlight, you can see these things are blocking in a real test system that would be hidden um, or shielded, et cetera. But one thing we see is that this peak looks pretty peaky. It looks a little bit more Gaussian than it does flat top. Uh, it's not particularly symmetric. If we consider the witness source, we however see a pretty Good flat top, relatively good symmetry. So, all right, we're off to a good start. What about temporal stability? To measure this, over 30 minutes, we took a picture of both sources every 10 seconds, and we determined what the signal on the camera pixel was. 
uh, from that source. I want to highlight also before I go on, I should have mentioned in the last slide, but we intentionally adjusted these sources so that the power from both was very similar. That is, what the camera saw from both sources was very similar. So we're not comparing apples to oranges. We're trying to compare apples to apples. Um, first thing to note, the tungsten ribbon is similar to John's black line, and it jumps up and down all over the place over that 30 minutes. I did mention this before. This is a bare tungsten ribbon. It is not wrapped uh, as is done downstairs in a ceramic sleeve, and that does help to alleviate this issue. However, it's important to note that the tungsten ribbon, no matter what, will have this problem. The integrating cavity is shown in blue lines. Excellent oral stability as we would hope for. Finally, we wanted to measure some optical surfaces to get a real world test. Um, so we measured a ground glass optic, which is very common. I showed you the DKIS primary mirror when it was in its ground state. And additionally, an aluminum light that we had in lab. We measured both surfaces with a white light interferometer to measure the surface roughness as a sanity check later on. So this process, first of all, looks like we use a litmus source, a long wave infrared camera, and we have our UUT, which is in the first case of ground glass. We test it. We then test an aluminum blank at room temperature. Finally, we test that same aluminum blank after it's under thermal load. So we heated it up to 150 degrees Celsius using a hot plate, and then we threw it in place and tested it. This is really important because optics uh, oftentimes can be expected to operate in a hot environment. You can think of solar collectors, you can think of the DKIS primary mirror, which is gonna be staring at the sun. Uh, and it's important to note, okay, we designed it and tested it, but is it going to be the right shape when it's actually being used. One other thing important to note here is that uh, for traditional deflectometry, the best that we can do is we do background images before we turn our source on, and that's how we remove background noise. So in the infrared spectrum, everything's radiating infrared light. All of you guys look like really bright light bulbs in the infrared. So it's important for us to be able to say, okay, all of that's noise in a test, we only want the, the light from the ribbon or the litmus source. Uh, the litmus source, because we can only flicker it at one hertz, what we instead did is we said, okay, scan, take a picture with the source on, take a picture with the source off, subtra subtract the two. So we're doing an updating background subtraction. Finally, to calculate the statistics across this, we performed five consecutive measurements of each optic, and we did this using each source. So what does the raw data look like? On the left-hand side, And that linear stage emits a lot of heat. Um, so that's what that signal is from. For the tungsten ribbon, for instance, you see the ribbon standing up here. You see, obviously, it's not flickering, but we're going to come in and pull back and subtract the background images of the source and the ribbon. And what we're left with is the ribbon, but 2,500 parts also the signal from the linear stage motor. Again, I do want to highlight. Light, but downstairs, when we made the DKIS mirror and uh, in updated tests, obviously you would shield the motor, uh, and not, not have that signal there. We then reconstructed the surfaces, and we see that the ground glass surface shown on top uh, or on the leftmost column was reconstructed using the tungsten ribbon and the litmus source. However, we were able to test it fully with the litmus source. In the middle column, we have the aluminum blank at room temperature. Both uh, methods could test it with no problem. And on the right-hand column, we have the aluminum blank after being heated, so under thermal load. And it was uh, not testable using the tungsten ribbon uh, for a variety of reasons. So to get into the statistics of it, which I'm sure you were all waiting for, 
we wanted to look at across five repeat measurements, how does the mean signal that we get uh, from the source reflected off the mirror fluctuate? So not only what is the mean signal, and then what's the signal to noise ratio using those mean values? That is from the signal as compared to the noise, how much bigger is the signal? That's really what we want is a large signal. And finally, we calculate the centroid, that is where the source was for one point on the mirror, uh, and how repeatable is it across those five measurements? So on the top uh, three row, we can note that the signal to noise ratio is constantly double for the one slit as the point is on the ribbon, and the centroid in here is significantly higher for the tungsten ribbon. If we look at the Aluminum blank tested at room temperature, the signal to noise ratio is about five times higher now. And again, the centroiding air is larger for the ribbon. However, it does not change very much for the slit. I want to highlight additionally that the noise that we calculate, which is calculated on the map, doesn't really change very much depending on what we're testing. So this is good because basically it's insensitive to, uh, to variable optics, yes. And then you have some um, large apparatus above it, which is probably metal. Do you have errors due to back reflections? Because the back reflections will vary at the same frequency <laughs> as your. No, that's yeah, that's a that's that's um that's a great question. I'm disappointed. I was expecting something sillier from you, Sam. Um, <laughs> I'll try harder. Yeah, no, that's a great that's a great point. Um, not only does everything emit in the infrared, but most things are highly reflective in the infrared. So that's something to consider in a true engineered system, and I'll talk about this in a second, you really wanna be sure that you eliminate any locations that you might have back reflections off of or ghost reflections that can bounce in and be operating at the same frequency and therefore throw off your signal. Um, that's a really great point. Uh, and then finally, uh, I just wanna highlight, we tested it with the litmus slit at under thermal load, but not with a tungsten ribbon. And one issue is that not only is the mirror emitting a huge amount under thermal load, so that background noise has a high signal, but additionally, as we had it configured, we place the mirror in and we're not keeping the hot plate on it. So we place the mirror in and it's probably cooling during this process. So that background signal is changing over the test. And that makes it extremely hard to accurately remove some dynamic background signal. All right, now on to something silly, Sam. We measure it something. This is our tested object. We measure it with the litmus source and we know we should get Neo and we do. It's a little bit off, but that's okay. We measure it again. Is it repeatable? Yes, we get Neo again and again and again. This is good. We know, okay, the source is very repeatable uh, and it seems to be pretty accurate. What about the tungsten ribbon? Great. First step, we get Neo. Second step, <laughs> second step, we get John Wick. I mean, it's still Keanu Reeves. It's still pretty accurate, but it's not Neo. Third step, Keanu Reeves <laughs> from Bill and Ted. So it still is producing something accurate, but the precision, that is the repeatability, isn't terribly great. And finally, of course, Keanu Reeves again from Point Break. In conclusion, I just want to highlight that the litmus source demonstrates improved infrared source characteristics. It allows for time modulation benefits, and these deserve further exploration. And finally, it allows for testing of an optic under thermal load with a possible variable background during testing. So I have a few concluding remarks. So in this case, how fast is this So is it scalable, meaning can you make it larger or Absolutely, so that's a great question. Um, the, the fundamental rate for these cap sources is one hertz. We can achieve 80% contrast ratio at one hertz. So if we try to go faster than that, our contrast is going to go down. Uh, however, we're by no means um, stuck with a box with a slit. We can make it bigger and put more sources in. We can coat the interior of the box, as I discovered, as Henry and I discovered a little bit later, with silver or gold to improve the reflectivity. Um, 
and we can change the shape. And I, I, and I will comment on that in the concluding remarks, but it definitely is pretty dynamic in what we can do with it, which is pretty exciting. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, one issue with that is that a mechanical slit, or maybe in some systems you would spin like a, a, a fan in front of it and it blocks it, unblocks it, et cetera, is that that can induce vibrations and it kind of throws in further uncertainties when we're testing in. Is it actually right here? Did it shake a little bit, um, which, which can cause some problems? And I do wanna say, I didn't put it up here, but we tested one of the slumped pieces of aluminum that you gave us, looked great. So for concluding remarks, for infrared, infin, infinite deflectometry, uh, Henry has some work ahead for him. Uh, I think that it's worth exploring stitching algorithms. So stitching, if you've ever taken a panorama, uh, we take multiple sub images and we stitch it in one big picture. We know that our stitching algorithm has some issues in the infinite deflectometry approach. We don't know it, but there's a possibility, I should say. And also there's a possibility that there's better stitching algorithms. Uh, Dr. Greg Smith brought up the excellent point that we could possibly leverage Brewster's angle in our test with infinite deflectometry. Uh, we have something with a highly curved surface and we're using a polarized source. So there's a very good chance that we will encounter Brewster's angle during our test. And consider the die attenuation during the test, this allows us to state with high certainty, okay, this point on the optic is experiencing Brewster's angle, therefore we know the surface slope very well, and that can be used for calibration. For infrared deflectometry, I think that we should optimize the device. Uh, maybe the surface roughness isn't perfect just yet. Maybe we could, not maybe, we should coat the interior of the surface with silver or gold to improve reflectivity. We could stack more cap sources on the inside uh, and expand outside of just this idea of testing with a ribbon or a slit, and maybe we can test something <laughs> convex, uh, or maybe we can test X and Y slopes simultaneously. That'd be pretty exciting. In conclusion, uh, deflectometry is a complementary test method uh, for freeform testing. It can be used as a tool in conjunction with other methods for an uh, optician. Testing without an accurate surface model now has more accurate results using the mid method. We can test from concave to convex and the infinite infrared deflectometry now has an improved source. Uh, I would like to acknowledge my friends who helped to widen my focus beyond research. Uh, obviously my family, I wouldn't be here without them. My loft peers, <clears throat> you guys know what you put up with. But don't complain about the basketball. I know that you guys enjoyed that. Uh, my professors and mentors, um, this research would not be here without them. And then finally, Dave Luke. Uh, and then here are the references and questions. I don't know. So yeah. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> so we're planning to submit the work to um, Applied Optics very soon in a special edition for the, for the College of Optics. Um, and we're pretty optimistic it'll get published. Um, but I think it's exciting research results and I think that the community should, should like it. And we have a draft version of that paper ready to submit, so yeah. Right, right. So, that's a great question. So uh, as Dr. Sugarling alluded to, I showed images of a sinusoidal pattern, which is testing the whole surface at once. And that's known as phase shifting deflectometry. 
And we use a phase unwrapping algorithm to get back what points on the screen we're measuring uh, or being measured. In the uh, wire case or the litmus source, we instead scan the source and then based off of a pixel's response over time, I'm gonna pull up that image actually. There we go. Um, this is a single pixel's response over time and we see for five repeat measurements. We see, okay, it's seeing nothing, 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 and then a signal, and then nothing, nothing, nothing. Basically, as that ribbon scanning, it starts to see a higher and higher uh, signal. And we use a centroiding algorithm to say, what is the center of that signal to calculate, okay, based on that, I know the source was exactly here. And then of course we do it in the X and Y directions to get the X and Y location. Does that answer the question? No, so that's yeah. No, that's a great question. I'm obviously biased. This is highly important and can never be replaced. Um, but I do think that deflectometry is easy. I, 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 Isaac showed yesterday he built one on an iPhone, um, and you can get insane accuracy. Not only that, but it's also relatively easy and cheap to set up, and for people who are fabricating mirrors, it's a really nice sanity check to say, okay, I measured something with the interferometer and I measured it with something else. Okay, they match. Like that's, it makes me feel a little bit more comfortable with it. Exactly, that's, yeah, <laughs> yes. Do you I guess, how do you define the exact location of the optic if you don't even know what shape it is? Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a fantastic question. So I alluded to earlier in the model-free uh, deflectometry, we calculate the piston. One way to do that is we use a CMM machine and we can touch one point on the surface. And then while we take a picture with the camera, we can correlate what point, not only where that was in three dimensions, but also which pixel is measuring that point. Um, but broadly speaking, downstairs, they'll use something called a laser tracker and they'll position it across the surface and get a series of measurements reflecting where that surface shape is very precisely, but only across, you know, several points as opposed to a high resolution image. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a fantastic idea. Um, and I think too, with the infinite deflectometry, it'd be really advantageous to mount fiducials or retro reflectors so that you can really precisely know where everything is throughout the test. The infinite deflectometry because it's moving. But yeah, same with the infrared. Along yes. that line, what precision do you need to measure the So typically uh, we would rely on the CMM precision, which as we use it, it's about plus minus 10 microns. However, downstairs when they're dealing with in a loose measurement. I saw the, the panic. Downstairs, however, when they're measuring the, the, uh, the mirrors for fabrication, they'll start to get um, extremely precise with the laser tracker. But it basically depends on what you need. If you need precision from high spatial frequencies to low spatial frequencies without air, then you have to get to like nanometer level accuracy. Um, but if you are okay with sacrificing some information, then you can start being at micron level accuracy or precision. So, uh, so I have a question. Um, let's say, I don't know, I was building a, a 1.5 meter diameter uh, parabola with a radius of curvature around uh, five meters. Um, 
I've got a pretty good idea of what the shape is, but if I'm going to be testing it with, uh, with either the IR deflectometry or, or Scott, is there any advantage to using the algorithms for the, the model for deflectometry? Yes, I would imagine that uh, if there are some deviations from your ideal shape, um, then the model free should help to better reflect that. And you don't sacrifice <clears throat> according to our measurements, and we should have more measurements to see if we're entering null spaces, but you don't sacrifice accuracy using that technique. You do sacrifice time, absolutely. So if time is a constraint, then I wouldn't recommend using it if you have an accurate surface model. Um, so it takes approximately, let me tailor my answer. It depends on your computer. For my computer, um, it took uh, like an hour and a half, basically. But as you get more pixels, so higher resolution, that can blow up to like days. Which, yeah. It's purely, the nice thing is that it's purely data processing. So if you have raw data, you can always apply this technique later on, assuming you have the requisite information about the object. Okay. All right, this is a follow-up on the The accuracy of the location only impacts your uh, spatial um, frequency range. It doesn't impact your precision in a given range. Does that make sense? Um, it does not. Do you mind clarifying that, actually? Okay, so if the how accurately you know the position of the constellation does it affect it? How does it affect the accuracy of your measurement? Is it oh, okay. actual accuracy, or does it just affect the range um, that uh, official? No, it's a great question. It's a, it's, it's slightly hard to describe, but you can imagine that any inaccuracy of any component means that for some local slope area that we're calculating, so one pixel mapped to the surface, we're going to calculate the incorrect surface slope. However, you can imagine that maybe if I just had the piston wrong, then what that's going to reflect as is not only will there be slight, slight errors at the local slopes, but primarily we're going to get the, the defocus across the whole mirror wrong because we're saying you know all the slopes are now steeper or less steep depending on how we get that piston wrong but if we have variation across maybe our source maybe we think okay we have a pure rectangular grid of pixels but it's a terrible screen and it's off or maybe our ribbon isn't scanning perfectly or twisting during then that means that each individual one might not be correlated to one another and we get higher frequency or mid frequency errors does that answer your question? Um, that's a great question. So yeah, right here. Uh, so there's several reasons. You, first of all, for uh, a parabola, for those of us not in the fabrication or optics realm, you get a you, you can remove spherical aberration by going with a parabola as opposed to a sphere. Um, of course, there are other benefits to it, but my primary primary part of me primary uh, understanding was that not only do you get good imaging characteristics, but also you get um, to have that un unobstructed field of view. But if you know other things, which I think you probably do because you've written plenty about telescopes, I'd love to hear about them. Um, oh, that's a good point. Are you, are you implying that there might be diffraction effects? Uh, 
Yeah. It's okay, you, you don't know this. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Ah, thank you for asking that. We definitely did. And basically, uh, it turned into a, a matter of time. But in this um, Daylani and Muller Trumber, we tried to do it parallel. That is, uh, instead of doing one pixel, then the next pixel, then the next pixel. You can imagine every camera pixel, we have to look at every surface plane. We wanted to parallelize it, so do a bunch at the same time. And basically, it turned into an issue of memory on my computer. And for the sake of time, at that point, it was my first publication. I'd taken too long to write it anyways. Uh, we just decided, OK, we're going to do it uh, in a serial fashion. Um, but there's no reason not to do it in a parallel fashion. <laughs> That is a great question because it was in lab. That's not the only answer. It was in lab. It has extremely high resolution. Um, and it also has very, uh, as Isaac showed, very good uh, source properties. It's bright. The color uniformity is really ideal. And these are things that we care about because, as I said earlier, if the pixels aren't actually rectangular or shaped as you think they are, then that would throw in a lot of uncertainty. And also, for our test setup, you need high resolution. No, I'm not. No. In your opinion, what is the biggest challenge going forward with this Um, I think, in my opinion, that finding some standard uh, format that can consistently achieve an excellent calibration, so you have high precision consistently, regardless of what you're testing would be the biggest challenge. Uh, it sounds somewhat trivial, or at least I thought it was trivial, and it's proven to be very hard. It's It splits into so many custom systems. Um, so that's my primary concern. There are ways you could do it, but frankly, I would point you towards using a spherometer. Or if you're in the call, if you're in the optics building, you already have access to a deflectometer system. Go downstairs and use an interferometer, and you can calculate the the power very precisely. The defocus of that surface is my recommendation because you'd spend too much time trying to calibrate the deflectometry system otherwise. <laughs> oh yeah no that's that's a great question um i this kind of highlights it but basically the other component that's not included in the outcome you can see that there's a kind of and moving out this external portion. Both the camera field of view and the size of our source are important characteristics for what we can test in terms of not only the size, but the slope range. Thank you. I'm going to ask you another question. Last question. One more time. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, if I graduate, um, my peer Isaac and I have started up a company, and we're going to be building optical software and additionally doing consulting work. Um, so yeah, if you guys need consulting work, <laughs> if I graduate, you know who to talk to. <laughs> okay.
Oh, we got that. Uh, that's 